This is section 9.1, Sequences. In this chapter, Infinite Series, we're going to be um, talking about what a series is, but in order to get to that point, we need to first talk about what sequences are. So this first section will be things that perhaps you've heard of before, perhaps not. Uh, I'm going to pretend like you've not heard it before and go from that standpoint. First of all, a sequence is a function and its domain is a set of positive integers. So um, one, two, three, four, five, etc. are the domain members. Now in uh, sequences, the variable for the domain, not x, it's n. Um, and that's gonna make a whole lot of sense here in just a few minutes because um, that n is the identifier of which term of the sequence you're dealing with. So like if n is 4, that's the fourth term of the se uh, sequence. All right, so, um, and it is a function. Um, we're used to uh, having function notation where we talk about y as a function of x. And in sequences, um, instead, we're going to be talking about a function first of all I guess I should say that uh, the functions that we're used to dealing with usually have a name like F or G or H um, and sequences instead of calling them F G and H we're going to usually call them letters like A and B and C are the most commonly used ones and instead of having the uh, parentheses with an indication of what the independent variable is behind it, x for what we're used to doing, um, we're going to use a subscript. So a sub n is how we'll see these written instead of f of x, this is a sub n, subscript n. All right, so um, when you have a sequence, uh, like if you had a function, uh, let's say 3x minus 4, something like that, um, that's a declaration of how you produce for any x you want to use all the values of y which gives you your range if you use every element of the domain that is um, the declaration here uh, notation is slightly different uh, we could have something like i squared minus oops I'm sorry not i n squared plus 4 or something like that. And um, so that's going to be a little bit different notation. Um, so if I want to refer to a particular term in the sequence, like the fourth term, I'll write a sub 4, and that represents the fourth term. That's kind of like uh, with functions, when you say f of four, that's the value of y when x is four. This, however, because the domain is the set of integer, positive integers, um, the value of n tells you where in the sequence that would be. So if we were to produce this sequence uh, that I wrote down, the first term is by substitution 1 squared plus 4, which is 5. The second term, a sub 2, will be 2 squared plus 4, which is 8. Uh, the third term, a sub 3, is 3 squared plus 4. Which is 13 and the fourth term 4 squared plus 4 is 20 and so this sequence would be first term is 5 comma the terms in a sequence are separated by commas so 5 comma 8 comma 13 comma 20, etc. 
Now, a lot of times, instead of doing substitution, if you want to find the next one, uh, if you've gotten enough terms there to establish a pattern that you're pretty sure is correct, um, you can um, you know, find the next element with some ease. So uh, some of you may see a pattern here, some of you may not. Um, the next one is, I figured out a pattern, I think it's 29, and I'm going to put dot, dot, dot. I'll let you think about it a second and see if you can come up with a pattern. I did not substitute, by the way. Uh, I guess I could have and cheated, but I didn't. Um, the pattern I saw was to go from 5 to 3, uh, sorry, 5 to 8, you add 3. To go from 8 to 13, I add 5. Go from 13 to 20, I add 7. So the pattern that I saw was add the next odd number. And what this kind of thinking is called is recursive thinking, where you find a pattern that gets you from one term to the next. Um, and so this, like, uh, most of us probably think recursively anyway. That's the way we, if I gave you a bunch of numbers in a pattern and, and you detected that pattern uh, to get from one term to the next, let's say you add one bigger um, odd number than the last time, then that's what we call recursive thinking. Um, when we're using the expression, for example, n squared plus four, and using that to substitute, that's called an explicit um, definition of the sequence. So it's an explicitly defined sequence. And in a few minutes, we'll look at what a recursively defined sequence looks like. But the explicitly defined sequence is uh, one that has a lot of strength because if I said, okay, I want you to skip several and uh, I want you to jump to the oh, 20th term, then if I were thinking recursively, I'd have to know the first 19 and discovered a pattern in order to expand that to the next one and get the 20th term. That's a weakness of recursive thinking. Recursive thinking strength is that's the way most of us do it. So that'll be intuitive. You'll mostly feel like you can do the recursive thinking um, pretty easily, most of you, uh, once you get a little bit of practice. But if you want to skip to a later term, that's where recursive thinking is weak. The explicitly defined sequence, however, um, allows you to just substitute into a formula and get any term you want. You don't have to know any of the previous terms to get the 20th one. So uh, I got 404. And I did not have to keep adding the next biggest odd number. So that's going to be a couple of different ways of defining sequences that we'll encounter. And as I said, the explicitly defined sequence is a little bit stronger form to use of the recursive thinking is uh, a little bit more intuitive. So uh, we'll probably kind of have a hybrid of, of using both, but I will tell you that the explicitly defined sequence for most applications is preferred. Um, so um, let's do a couple of practice uh, sequences. Uh, a. A sub n is a sequence defined by this formula, 3 plus negative 1 to the n. Of course, the arithmetic here is not that challenging. Um, I don't think you're going to find these problems to be extremely difficult to produce the terms of a sequence. After all, it's just substitution into a relatively simple formula. So um, I'm going to substitute in 1 and 2 and 3 and probably 4 at least and get those answers and then um, write the sequence. 
And if I've detected a pattern, instead of by substitution, I'm going to hope that I can just extend the pattern without having to substitute, which will speed things up a little bit. Oops, I wrote that as a 2 instead of a 4. Excuse me. This is a 4. All right, so uh, 3 plus negative 1 is 2. Negative 1 squared is 1. 3 plus 1 is 4. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1. 3 plus negative 1 is 2. Negative 1 to the 4th is 1. 3 plus 1 is 4. And what I have so far is 2 plus 4 plus 2. I'm sorry, not plus. 2, 4, 2, 4. And I think I've got a pattern going here. I'm going to guess that the next two are 2 and 4. Yep, you got it. By the way, to continue a sequence, we write the ellipses, dot, dot, dot. Those three dots are called ellipses, and that means continue in the same pattern. So um, that's going to be something that we see a lot of, is the dot, dot, dot in this, because it, we do want to use all positive integers in our domain, which means that the sequence goes on forever. Okay, so let's look at B. B sub n is defined as n over 1 minus 2n to 2. The first term, 1 over 1 minus 2 times 1. The second term, by substitution, is 2 over 1 minus 2 times 2. Third term is 3 divided by 1 minus 2 times 3. And I'll say if there aren't a particular number of terms of the sequence that you're asked to produce, like if they say write the first four, write the first five, write the first seven terms, then of course you do that. I'm going to ask that you Calculate the first four at least, and then see if you see a pattern and can extend it. And if you don't see a pattern, don't worry too much about it quite yet. Um, some of these that I'm doing right now are, are kind of easy. Uh, some of the ones that you'll see later are a little bit more challenging. So if you don't get it right away, don't worry. Just go ahead and, and do substitution to get the next few terms. It's not a problem. All right, so this one simplifies to be negative 1. The second term is negative two-thirds. Third term is negative three-fifths. The fourth term is negative four-sevenths. So the sequence is negative one, comma, negative two-thirds. Negative three-fifths. <coughs> negative four-sevenths. Etc. Well, it appears that every uh, term of the sequence is negative, so I'm going to guess that that's negative. The numerators seem to be increasing by 1 each time, so the next one will be 5. The denominators tend to be increasing by, look, appear to be increasing by 2 each time, so that should be 9. And then you can check that with substitution. And if you substitute, you'll find out, oh, yep, yeah, that's it, that's correct. So the next one should be negative 6 over 11. All right, so um, that's not too hard. As I said earlier, I think you're not going to find that this part of it is at all challenging. And in fact, a lot of this is pre-calculus material that we're reviewing. So this, this should seem like an easy task. Um, we are going to go further than this, of course, but this is just to get our feet wet. OK, C sub n is defined as n squared over 2 to the n minus 1. So the first term is 1 squared over 2 to the first minus 1. C sub 2 is 2 squared divided by 2 to the second, or 2 squared, minus 1. The third term 
is 3 squared divided by 2 raised to the third power minus 1 and the fourth term is 4 squared divided by 2 to the fourth minus 1. So if you do all of that arithmetic you should get 1 4 thirds 9 sevenths 16 fifteenths. So the sequence is 1, 4 thirds, 9 sevenths, 16 fifths, uh, sorry, 16 fifteenths, etc. Okay, so um, each numerator is uh, the next perfect square, so 4, 9, 16, 25, then 36, then 49, etc. And it appears that um, if I thought of 1 as 1 over 1, I added 2 to 1 to get 3. I added 4 to 3 to get 7. I added 8 to 7 to get 15. So it, it looks like I'm adding the next power of 2. So if I added 8 here, 2 cubed, to go from 7 to 15, maybe I should write that down because some of you may not be thinking what I'm thinking. So I'm looking at just the denominators here. Um, 1 over 1, I added 2. So I'm going to think of that as 2 to the first. Here I added 4. I'm going to think of that as 2 squared. Here I added 8. I'm going to think of that as 2 cubed that I added. And so if I add 2 to the 4th to get the next denominator, I'll be adding um, 16 to 15. And that, of course, is 31. Oops. Oh, well, I guess color doesn't matter there. So anyway, um, that's how you would um, produce this sequence. So the next one should be 36. 2 to the 5th is 32 plus 31 is 63. And you can double check that in the formula. That would be 2 to the 6th, which is uh, 64 minus 1 is 63. Yep, that's right. OK, so these three, the first three, A, B, and C, have all been recursive, I'm not sorry, explicitly defined sequences. The uh, fourth one, D, here, fourth example in this uh, sequence of problems is going to be one that's recursively defined. So this time this is going to be different. Um, so kind of pay attention to this. This is going to be a sequence where um, I'm going to tell you what the first term or first few terms are. That's part of the recursive definition because you have to know what you're starting with. Um, for example, if, um, if I had written, okay, I want you to add three every time to get the next term. So you could say, okay, um, seven, just a random number. So the next one's 10, then 13, then 16, etc. And someone else says, no, 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 this, that's not what I got. I got one, four, 7, 10, etc. Well, who's right? Who's wrong? Well, actually, they're both right because you didn't give them enough information as to which one of those is correct. You have to specify the first term. So if I said, I want you to find the sequence where you add 3 to get the next one, but I want you to start with um, 16. No, let's make it 15. Um, that one, the one that I had in mind, it didn't sound like I did, but I, I guess I did. Um, I'll say I did. Is this one, the, the third one I wrote. So this uh, recursive definition, you must declare what your first term or first few terms are. And the other thing you have to do is establish how you're going to get the next one, like add three or whatever. 
So um, the way that we write that is if d sub n is the nth term, d sub n plus 1 is the n plus first term. It's the one right after the nth one. And to get the next term, which is how I'll refer to the d or a or b sub n plus 1 is the next term, to get the next term in this one, we're going to take the nth one, the one that we know, the last one that we got, and subtract 5. So starting with 25, that'll be our first term. That's redundant, I know. Um, the second term, and I'm going to slow this down the first time or two, um, the second term is going to be d sub 1 plus 1, which is going to be d sub 1 minus 5, or more simply 25 minus 5, which is 20. Okay, I'm going to do one more like that, the slow way, and then uh, you're going to see that that's not really necessary. To get the third term, uh, what number plus 1 is 3? Well, of course, that's 2, so this is going to be d sub 2 plus 1. And if n is 2 now, uh, that means that we're going to take d sub 2 and subtract 5. And what's the value of d sub 2? It's the last answer. It's 20. Subtract 5, which is 15. Um, what I generally do is not, I don't write all that stuff down, and I don't even uh, think of it exactly that way, to be quite honest. What I do, now that I've got kind of an idea of how this goes, I'm going to look at the last answer I got, 15, and subtract 5 from it. And each time I'm going to subtract 5 from the last answer, so d sub 5 will be the last answer minus 5, which of course is 5. And so this sequence is 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, etc. And you can see recursively, now that it's written down, that each one is 5 less than the previous term. And that's recursive thinking. And this up here, um, when we started Part D, this right here is the definition of that sequence. It's got multiple parts here. You've got to declare your first term or terms, and you have to tell me what you're going to do to prior terms, like d sub n, to get the current term that you're looking for, d sub n plus 1. Okay, so another task that I'm going to have you do is, given a sequence, can you write the um, definition of it? So let's say that um, this one here is f sub n. Ooh, actually using f, which is really odd with, with, func with uh, sequences. Usually use f, g, and h for functions. Um, I skipped e because e is a number, and I kind of didn't want to use that. It's kind of like my avoidance of i as a variable because that gets confused with the square root of negative 1 too easily. Um, so anyway, if I were asking you to write this one, um, you would say, okay, well, the first term is 15. And to get the next term, f sub n plus 1, what will I do to the last answer, 15, to get the next one? Well, I'll take it, the prior term, which is f sub n, and add 3. And that is the definition of the sequence 15, 18, 21, 24, etc. Okay, so going this reversal of I give you a sequen sequence, you find out what its um, definition would be is a good exercise. And uh, as I said, a lot of times you're going to be able to think of the recursive pattern. Um, I think writing the recursive pattern is a little bit more difficult. Uh, not hard yet, but more difficult than the explicit will be. Um, the only problem with the explicit is trying to figure out well, what would I do to get that? What would produce that? And so, um, at any rate, we'll come back to that later. I just wanted to, to give you a little bit of indication of where this um, will probably take us and some of the things we'll be talking about. So, let's get back to the notes. The primary focus of this chapter concerns sequences whose terms approach limiting values. So, um, let's look at, at one that we just did. 
are these terms of this sequence headed towards a specific value? Well, you might think, oh, it's headed towards zero, but actually the next one will be zero, then the next one after that will be negative five, then negative 10, negative 15, negative 20. And if you keep going, you're gonna keep getting numbers that are smaller and smaller and smaller, and you're not headed towards a specific number, you're headed toward the concept of negative infinity. So this one does not converge to a particular value, and when it doesn't converge, we say that it diverges. So this sequence right here diverges. That's what it means, or that's how you say that it doesn't converge. Um, this sequence diverges. The majority of our thought, though, will be, um, as especially as we go on to the rest of the chapter, is looking at sequences that actually do converge to a particular value. So, for example, uh, this sequence, one half, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth, one over thirty two, etc is the sequence. If I don't give you the nth term, um, a sub n is the nth term, what we call a general term. Uh, and by the way, if you can find the general term, that's going to be the definition of the sequence, by the way, that's really important. So if we want to write that in the sequence, we'll write dot, 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 until we get to the nth term, whatever n is, could be the 50th or the 100th or whatever, but this is a general term. And uh, to write what that is, it looks like the numerator is always one. And the domain elements that produce these are n values of one and two and three and four and five produce those. So the process here is to think, what would I do to the number n that would create that, in this case, the denominator value. And you can think about it a while. Uh, the recursive pattern is you're multiplying by two each time. And that might help you. Like I said earlier, it's sort of a hybrid of the two things that we're thinking. Recursively, I get multiply the denominator by two each time. Well, if you repeatedly multiply by two, what's the compact way to say repeated multiplication? Well, yes, that's exponentiation. So if you are repeatedly multiplying by something, then it makes sense that your formula is going to involve exponentiation. In fact, every single one of these denominators is a power of two. It's two to the nth, comma. I should probably go back to the other color. Dot, dot, dot means it keeps on going forever. So um, in this particular case, um, that means that we figured out that this particular sequence is defined by 1 over 2 to the nth. Okay. It's going to take practice to get good at this. So if that wasn't as quick as figuring out that you're doubling the denominators. Um, it will get better. It will get faster. Okay, but anyway, as... Um, you go on forever and ever, 1 over 32, 1 over 64, 1 over 128, 1 over 256, 1 over 512, 1 over 1024, etc. Those sequence terms are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so um, we talk about that value that it's headed toward, um, if it does actually head toward a value, as saying that this sequence converges, and if it converges, I'd like to know what it converges to, to what number does it head, um, and in this case, this one converges to zero, so it's headed towards zero. And we could find that analytically by not just thinking numerically what happens if I just keep going. 1 over 1,024 was the last one I said, 1 over 2,048, 1 over 4,096, etc. Well, instead of doing that, let's use a limit. The limiting process has become quite a, an important thing in calculus, and let's just do it again. Uh, let's find the limit of our a sub n. 
in this particular case. Yep. And by the way, you couldn't do this with a recursively defined one. It has to be an explicit definition to do this easily. Um, so as n goes to infinity, powers of 2 just increase, and 1 divided by a huge number is headed toward 0 in this particular example. So I should probably erase the, the one of these equal signs because it's not really valid, uh, because it's not always 0. So um, in fact, what we're going to call what that approaches, if it actually does approach something, we're going to call that L. The limit of the sequence. And there's a definition uh, there that involves epsilon and the capital letter M and a whole bunch of stuff. I'm not really interested in your understanding that per se. Um, it's, it's technical jargon and uh, if you go into a more advanced math class you'll um, get to encounter this type of jargon again and really focus on it. So I'm not going to do that in this particular case. So let's just keep on going. Um, you can look, I think I put in some pages where uh, they're explaining uh, how, the, in fact, I'm not sure I did. So let me just draw this picture. Um, if you have for, oh, and by the way, you can graph sequences. Probably should have done this already. I just didn't, I forgot. Um, so let's say we're doing... Um, a graph of this sequence, one half, one fourth, etc. Uh, I think I called it a sub n. Let me double check. I think I did. Yeah, I called it a sub n. And so if this is a value of 1, then the sequence is uh, when n is 1, the output is 1 half. When n is 2, the output is 1 fourth. Then 1 eighth then 1 16th, 1 over 32, 1 over 64, etc. Um, graphs of sequences are not connected because the only inputs are integers. We are not getting any values between, for example, 1 and 2. So we should not connect this because that would imply that there is actually an answer when n is 6.3 or whatever, and there's not. A sequence doesn't do that. Um, if this were a function in terms of x, we could. But when it's a sequence, the only allowed values for n are positive integers. So this graph is never going to be one that you connect. Okay, so um, the graph I'm referring to, kind of a general graph, is the one that looks maybe like this, where you have um, Maybe a sequence that looks like this. I'm trying to mimic what they did. Uh, if, if I put this picture in yours, uh, look at it, because it's going to be a better picture than I can produce. Okay, so let's say that the limit, and, and you probably have surmised by now that that limit, L, is uh, a number it's approaching. And what that means is that there's a horizontal asymptote for this graph that the values are approaching. Okay, so it does re relate to things that we're familiar with um, in functions. Uh, it's just we don't have a connected graph here. So this is going to be some a sub n in general that looks like this. And the, the theorem, the, the jargon that I was referring to earlier, uh, is kind of hard to understand at first. Um, but if you were to take some small number epsilon, and add it to L and subtract it from L. This is the Greek letter epsilon that I'm using. Um, you get these two numbers, L plus epsilon and L minus epsilon. And that creates a band of values um, above and below the limit by some unspecified small value. And the um, definition of the limit above means that once you pass a certain value of x called um, big M, 
Once you get past that, every single term of the sequence will be between those pink lines that I drew. So before that, you know, we had lots of values that were outside of that range above in this particular picture, um, but definitely outside of our range uh, from L minus epsilon to L plus epsilon. But once you pass M, they're all going to be there. And it, if you make M arbitrarily large, uh, when epsilon is made arbitrarily small, that means you're just going to get closer and closer and closer to L, which will require a bigger M to make that happen. So as the value M uh, increases, uh, we'll be seeing epsilons that are getting smaller and smaller. And if, you, if that actually happens, that there is an M beyond which everything is between those two pink lines, then the limit exists and is L. Um, and epsilon, again, will be made arbitrarily small. So you don't have to really understand that jargon. I'm not going to ask you to prove anything using it. I just wanted you to have an idea of what it meant, sort of graphically, so that you, when you read it, you wouldn't be going, oh my gosh, what is this stuff? What do they mean? Um, so um, there are a lot of times we're going to be relying on stuff we already know. So um, for example, that last one, there is a function f of x that's related to that sequence. It's a function that has um, outputs and every single one of the sequence terms is an output on this function. Of course this function uh, 1 half to the x or 1 over 2 to the x is um, going to look like let's see going to look like a uh, graphic like this. And that function is a, an infinite set of points upon which you can superimpose the sequence and the any sequence element that exists for 1 over 2 to the n will be a point somewhere on this curve not just somewhere, I guess, at integer values of x. So if you have a function that agrees graphically with every point of the sequence for the domain of the sequence, positive integers, then we're going to relate those two to each other. And um, to find the limit um, of this is something we know how to do. It's actually a lot like what we just talked about. Um, as x goes to infinity of 1 over 2 to the x, of course that's 0 with the same thinking process we did before. Um, the reason why we need to be able to compare to a function f of x is that there are some limit things that only work for continuous functions. Sequences are not connected. That means they're not continuous. Therefore, those techniques for finding limits would not be available to us. But if we can find a function f of x that agrees with it for all positive integers n, we can find the limit of that function of x. And theorem 9.1 says that if that um, limit exists, the limit of f of x as x approaches infinity is L then that means that if we have a, a related sequence, as I already described, then the limit of a sub n, as n goes to infinity, will therefore have to also be L. So because this one heads towards 0 right here, this one heads towards 0, that implies that this one has to as well. Okay, So that's what the theorem 9.1 implies. So. Uh, let's do another example. Uh, we're about to run out of room. Yeah, so uh, maybe this one example and then I'll, I'll need to open up a new one for us. Uh, let's see, move this up a little bit. Okay, so um, we're given a sub n is 1 plus 1 over n to the n. And we want to find the limit of this sequence. We want to find the limit as n approaches infinity 
for a sub n, which is, of course, 1 over 1 plus n to the nth. Well, um, with limits, you always try substitution. And uh, if we did that, 1 over an infinitely big number will head towards 0. And 1 plus close to 0 is getting closer and closer to 1. And 1 to infinity um, is an indeterminate form. So you have to use L'Hopital's rule. Well, L'Hopital's rule, if you'll recall, um, says that if you have a limit, as x approaches a for some function, a can be infinity or a, or negative infinity or a constant like six or whatever. Um, if, oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't write that exactly correctly. I didn't write the whole thing. I need to erase this and start again. Of um, something in the form of a fraction, some f of x over g of x. And as you substitute into that, if you get um, either 0 or over 0 or infinity over infinity, and that infinity can be positive or negative, both of them or one of them, um, then L'Hopital's rule applies. Um, only then. Uh, let's see if I remember how to spell his name. L'Hopital. I think that's how you spell it. So L'Hopital's rule applies. So what L'Hopital's rule says is that if you get one of those two indeterminate forms, either 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, you can, by L'Hopital's rule, so what I'm going to ask that you do if you're using L'Hopital's rule for the equal sign where you're applying that rule, write capital L, capital H, and that tells me that you're using L'Hopital's rule. And that will have the same limit value, accidentally wrote n, the same limit value as x approaches a if you were to find the derivative of the numerator over the derivative of the denominator. Notice this is not a quotient rule. This is limit of, um, limit of the ratio of their two derivatives done separately. Okay. So that's L'Hopital's rule again. Um, that's something I'm, I'm sure you encountered in your Calculus 1 experience. At least I hope you did. Um, probably again in this course, by the way. I think we may have seen it before now. At any rate, um, there are other indeterminate forms besides these, and 1 to infinity is, is one of the more challenging ones. But before I say that, um, in order to find a derivative of a function, you can only take a derivative of a continuous function. You can't take the derivative of a discontinuous function. So that's going to stymie us if we're within the world of sequences, because sequences are not continuous. continuous. But luckily for us, we can say, well, let's let f of x that's related to that sequence, which will be defined as 1 plus 1 over x raised to the x, and find the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over x to the x. And again, what we'll get as x gets bigger and bigger is going to be the indeterminate form 1 raised to the infinity. And when you have these powers that are indeterminate, like 1 to the infinity, what we're going to do is um, we're going to say, well, let's let that limit that we're trying to find be called something like y or a temporary designation. I'm just going to call that y. Then, when powers are involved, what I'm going to do, and you'll see why in a second, uh, very clearly, I hope. Oops. There we go. Um, if we're going to take the natural logarithm of both sides of this equation.
then we're going to employ one of the properties of limits that we learned in calculus one, namely the property that as the limit as x approaches a of a composition f of g of x. You can take that limit inside and evaluate that by finding f of the limit as x approaches a of g of x. And we're going to use that property in reverse. My function f here is ln of, and you see the limit of g of x, where g of x is that 1 plus 1 over x to the x. So I'm going to reverse this over here and rewrite that right-hand side. The left-hand side isn't changing, by the way, as the limit as x approaches infinity of the ln of 1 plus 1 over x to the x. Then we're going to use a property of logarithms. Oh, I keep writing h instead of l. don't know why I keep doing that. Um, the natural logarithm of a power is the, co uh, the exponent rewritten as a coefficient. So that exponent is going to be multiplied by the natural logarithm of the base of that power. x to the a is a power. Its exponent goes out in front and you leave the base behind the ln. So using that property, I'm going to take that x out in front of the ln. Um, I'm hoping you're realizing just how much of what we do in calculus relies on heavily on prior knowledge from prior courses. So uh, th that's why this one will seem hard at first because you haven't done some of this stuff in a while and you haven't thought, oh, that's something I can do that'll help. And I get that. So I uh, just wanted to say I, I do get that frustration. So um, if I were to try to substitute infinity in here, I'd get infinity. And of course, that would the thing inside parentheses would head toward 1. The natural log of 1 is 0. That's infinity times 0, which is another indeterminate form. Um, we can't use L'Hopital's rule unless it's 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. So what I'm going to do to make this work out is I'm going to use one of the properties of um, division. It's called the definition of division. And I can think of a times b as um, a divided by the reciprocal of b. It's a definition of division. Or if you want to go the other way, a divided by 1 over b is the same thing as a times b over 1. And that can be written as a over b. Oh, I'm sorry, I wrote that wrong. a over. So this division becomes that a over and a divided by 1 over b. Okay, or we could have taken the a down and it would have become b over 1 divided by a. Either one of those is, is going to work. So using that property, that product of 0 times infinity, I'm going to deal with that by, let's say, let's take the x down into the denominator. So the other term will still be in the numerator. And the x, when it goes down into the denominator, will become its reciprocal, so 1 over x. And this time, the ln expression again goes to 0, and the denominator expression as x in, uh, increases without bound, 1 divided by that unbounded number is headed towards 0, and that means that we can now use L'Hopital's rule. So uh, 
We've been doing a lot of other things, and we're finally getting to L'Hopital's rule in this problem. So by L'Hopital's rule, this will become the limit as x approaches infinity of the derivative of ln of something. Uh, I probably should have given myself some more room. Uh, this is going to kind of look like I'm going downhill. Um, the natural log function uh, numerator thing is its derivative is 1 over the argument, 1 over the something that you're taking the natural logarithm of, times the derivative of that something. The derivative of 1 is 0. The derivative of 1 over x, I'm going to go off to the side and, and uh, help you think through this, is the same thing as the derivative with respect to x of x to the negative first. And bring down the power and decrease the power by 1. And so that's negative x to the negative 2. So times the opposite of x to the negative 2. Okay, so that was the derivative of the natural log of something is 1 over that something times the derivative of that something over the derivative of the denominator separately. Well, the derivative of 1 over x we just found out is negative x to the negative 2. I'm not going to go off to the side and rewrite all that. I already did it once, so I can use what I already have. Afraid we're about to run out of room. Yeah, I'm not going to get much more in here. Okay, um, which is unfortunate because I have several steps to go. Anyway, uh, I'll see how much of this I can squeeze in. So I'm not going to be writing this in a pretty fashion, I'm afraid. All right, so you might notice that algebraically the negative x to the negative 2 um, cancels algebraically. You can just wipe those out. And uh, you're left with 1 over 1 plus 1 over x over 1, which I'm not going to write because it's not necessary. Then I'm going to see if I can evaluate that limit now that I've done L'Hopital's rule. You always try and see if substitution will work. And the x in there is in the denominator of a fraction. And 1 over infinity, that fraction is going to head toward 0. And the limit of a constant is that constant. So that what we'll get on the right side is 1 over 1 plus 0 which is 1 over 1, which equals 1. Now keep in mind, we were trying to find a limit, and we temporarily called it y at the beginning of this process. And so now we need to solve this equation for y, and that will be our limit. Well, I'm hoping you recall um, exponentiation it, uh, as something you can do to both sides of an equation. So I'm going to exponentiate both sides of this equation as a power of e. So I'm introducing a base and um, raising both sides to that same base. And you may recall that e to the ln of anything, because they're uh, inverse functions, gives you back that thing. So e to the ln of y gives me back y. And of course, e to the first is e. So that means that what we originally called y temporarily was this limit. So that means that this limit is e. By the way, this is one of the definitions of the number e. And then you can conclude that therefore for our sequence, the limit as n approaches infinity, this is using theorem 9.1, uh, as n approaches infinity, the sequence defined by 1 plus 1 over n to the nth will equal the same thing we just got when f of x was um, considered. And this limit, therefore, is also e. All right, so that's going to end this part of the lesson. Stop this recording, and I'll start a new one.